Good evening, Libertarians. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of LPTV, our town hall. Uh, I'm going to be joined tonight by several guests, and we're going to be talking about the unrest that is gripping our country, talking about some of the issues that are facing not just Libertarians, but our country as we deal with what is obviously a broken system. And for Libertarians, it's a frustrating thing because for a long time we've been talking about demilitarizing the police. We've been talking about community policing. We've been talking about the fact that uh, policing is not being done in a fair way in our country right now, especially, you know, related to drug laws, stuff like that. But if you think it's frustrating for a libertarian to say we've been saying this stuff for a long time, imagine what it's like to be an African-American libertarian and be in that community. And to that end, I'm going to bring in my first guest, John Mons. John, thank you so much for joining us on LPTV. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So I'm going to introduce you a little bit. Uh, presidential candidate, obviously, in 2020. Uh, candidate for governor of Georgia when you got over a million votes. Um, and what what other fascinating things? A Morehouse man, of course. Um, what other fascinating things should I tell people about you? Uh, well, one correction that the the... The race that I got a million votes in was actually in 2008. That was uh, the cycle before governor, and that was for a statewide office. Uh, got it. And and then I ran for governor in 2010. Um, you know, I've been an active member of the NAACP for a number of years, uh, worked locally in my community, uh, working with programs like Habitat for Humanity, building homes uh, for those uh, low income individuals. Um, doing a lot of stuff in the, in the local community and a long time active and, and happy libertarian party member. That's a, well, that's a great thing to know because, you know, one of the things that libertarians talk about all the time is that, you know, there really are all of these voluntary organizations out there that people can be a part of that don't require government. For example, Habitat for Humanity, which builds houses uh, and that we need to be the change that we want to see in the world. So I'm really Happy to hear you talk about uh, being involved in those things in your community. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about today is Juneteenth. And I grew up in Texas, and we always celebrate Juneteenth on June 19th. But my understanding is that in Georgia, it's a different day. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my father and side of the family is from Georgia. Uh, my family's been here for almost 160 years. And in his his hometown, Thomaston, Georgia, which is in Upson County, uh, their holiday is actually called uh, May 29th. And wow. it's celebrated on the Saturday closest to Memorial Day weekend. And that's because that's when they heard the Emancipation Proclamation back in 1863, which was earlier than um, they heard it in in Texas. And that's you know, one of the reasons why you have a disparity of dates uh, is because it really depends on the local communities a lot of times and, and what time, what day they heard the proclamation. For example, in in, in my town that I live in now, Cairo, Georgia, which is right above the Florida line in southwest Georgia, uh, that community celebrates uh, what they call May Day. And their day was May the 20th. And that's the same day also in Tallahassee, Florida, that they uh, they celebrate and have a reading of the Emancipation uh, Proclamation every year. So that's why you, you have uh, some different dates across the country, but they all are celebrating the same thing. And that was uh, freedom, uh, at least the declaration of it, you know, with the Emancipation Proclamation. Right. And it's fascinating, too, that, you know, it hits different areas and different times. And so. Uh, you talked about Georgia. We talked about Texas. Let's talk briefly about Connecticut. Welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Aaron Lewis. Dr. Lewis, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. Glad to see um, John Mons as well. Outstanding. I don't know if you guys have ever met before, but here's a quick little introduction. John, Aaron, yeah. Aaron, John. Now, There's what about no in, <laughs> in Connecticut? When Do you guys celebrate Juneteenth in Connecticut? Yes, yes. Since, since um, 2003. So it's a it's a much more modern uh, thing there. And do you guys use June nineteenth as the date, or is it uh, something else? 
Yes, we do. We we typically um, use June June nineteenth, uh, but it fluctuates, and for the most part, it's always on you know the last Friday closest to June nineteenth that it, that it's celebrated every single year. Gotcha. Interesting. So let me uh, talk a little bit too. We talked about June nineteenth, Juneteenth, and sort of this celebration, and it's a unique thing. A lot of people are talking right now about the idea that Juneteenth is in reality. Uh, one of the most American holidays because it truly celebrates liberty. Uh, Absolutely. And I, I wonder if you guys have can talk to a little bit about that, about celebrations that you've been to in the past, what they've been, what happens when, if you've gone to a, a Juneteenth celebration. And uh, why don't we go in reverse order since I had, Dr. I had John Mons on first. We'll go with you, Dr. Lewis, and then I'll come to you, John, with that question. I mean, when, when you talk about, um, you know, liberation, um, as well as, you know, our Emancipation Proclamation for every person of color, uh, the day that we were free from oppressive laws, oppressive policies would be a celebratory moment for um, people of color. Um, so it, it, it is our Independence Day uh, more than any other day for us. Um, July the 4th, uh, for many people of color, uh, don't resonate in the same way because right. um, it, it we didn't receive uh, the same um, uh, we were not uh, factored into uh, the deal <laughs> like right. some of our other you know um, uh, American counterparts and as a result um, it's not a real reason to celebrate um, like other people in America would when on the Fourth of July for us uh, it can actually be considered a very painful moment because um, there was a lot of um, treacherous behavior that was still going on uh, um, under the name and guise of the law. So um, so this is a, a special moment for us um, to commemorate freedom, which is uh, really what um, equality is all about. And that's a, that's a great point. And so I've heard people talk about that beforehand. Uh, and I, I, you know, people, uh, friends of mine, African-American, have said, you know, July 4th, that's not our big holiday. That's not our big Independence Day. Uh, and I wonder, uh, John, if you, I don't know if that's a, you've heard that talk before, anything like that, but talk about what Juneteenth celebrations have meant to you and what they've been like. Well, like, like I said earlier, uh, Georgia also recogn recognizes Juneteenth and has been doing so, I believe, since 2011. But uh, in my dad's hometown, uh, They've had a, a parade, uh, and this has been going on continuously since 1863. I believe it's one of, they claim to be the longest continuous celebration of, uh, of freedom uh, in, in, in the country. And you know, I've been to some, I haven't been to, to some recently, but I've been to them in the past. And uh, they normally have a speaker. You, you march down from downtown, uh, to uh, Lincoln Park, which is an area, an African-American community. And that's where they have a speaker. They, ha they have uh, vendors with food and a lot of people just, just gather and, and have a great time. Uh, in South Georgia, I, I know uh, they had a, a part of the ceremony was uh, called Lincoln Padding Park, the, the area of an African-American community. And that's where they have a speaker. They, ha they have uh, vendors with food and, and a lot of people just, just gather and Hello? Okay. Yeah, you still there, John? Sorry, we're getting a little echo for a second. Yeah. Car is on it. Okay. Um, in, in South Georgia, they, they had what they call plaiting the maypole. And this was something that was uh, uh, done at schools in which they'd have different colored uh, streamers and, and kids would uh, go in and out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You heard about it, in and out around the, the maypole. And also you would you would get a day off from school. And, and, and it was truly celebrated as a holiday. And yeah. unfortunately, uh, a lot of these uh, celebrations have kind of gone by the wayside. I, I know in, in Cairo, where I live, it's not really celebrated. Uh, Thomasville, which is in the community uh, next to us, the next county over, um, there was some interest in kind of restarting the celebration, but uh, it, it hasn't really gone anywhere. But uh, it definitely in the past was akin to uh, the 4th of July. I mean, it was it was. Uh, 
you know, time for celebration and remembrance and hope, uh, you know, across different communities all across the country. So that's that. that thank you very much for that. Those recollections. It's a, it's a fascinating thing. I want to touch on something that I talked about in the very beginning uh, that, you know, right now we have this period of civil unrest going on uh, where people are protesting and asking for, you know, demilitarizing the police uh, things that, you know, libertarians have been asking for for a long time, uh, talking about police brutality, things that libertarians have been talking about a long time. And, you know, I mentioned at the front of the show that it's frustrating for libertarians, but it must be especially frustrating for African-American libertarians because, you know, you guys, you've known this, right? The names that Americans are learning right now, I mean, Americans who have, you know, forgotten Trayvon Martin, Americans, you know, who never heard of Breonna Taylor, you know, forgotten uh, Eric Garner, mm -hmm. all those things. But in the African-American community, these are battles for liberty and battles for justice that have been going on for a long time. Can you talk about what it means to be both libertarian and black at this point in time and having conversations with people who have been unaware of these things beforehand? Dr. Lewis, let's go with you first. I mean, you know, I, you know that I, I write extensively uh, on various topics. One of them um, includes the topic of race. I mean, you know, for, for people of color, it's not new to us. It's, this, this is not something that's new. This, this has happened for centuries. Um, so the, stra the strange response and reactions from white people um, is, 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 is bizarre because uh, most of my white friends are acting as, and they will even say that, you know, what, what is all this tension about? <laughs> and, you know, and what, why, are, why are these people, you know, starting racism? And I'm thinking to myself, do you hear yourself? You, you know, racism is not starting. It's always been here. And I always give the analogy of a cancer that's in remission. I mean, anytime we don't see what's happening now, it's only cancer that's in remission. And you could eat the wrong food, be in the wrong environment, or, or, or have some anxiety, and that cancer will begin to metastasize through the body. And the reason why it still exists in the way that it does is because the policy that is in place has never been written for Black people, and, and, and which is one of the reasons, the, the main reasons, that I'm a part of the Libertarian Party as a hope um, to uh, counter a two-party system, both of whom have um, clearly not included people that look like me in their original plan. We've been the byproduct, we've been the end result, we've been the pawn, uh, we've been the indentured servants as a part of the plan, but we've never been a part of the original plan which includes justice, equity, and, and a word that we don't even use anymore, dignity, just dignity. And so when I look at people that look like me, I look at dignity. I look into the eyes and the face of dignity. That's not what many people can say in America when they look at a black man in particularly. Uh, they, they see the stereotype of people that have labeled an entire group of people from a diaspora for 400 years. And so when I think about this, I think about the pervasive ignorance of people that persist in, you know, and, and then think about it, we are in 2020. You know, when you when you really wanna, wanna know, it's like, come on, man. I, I could see if this was the 60s, the antebellum South, you know, of the, the days of the Confederacy. We are in 2020. It's like all of us need to grow up. This shouldn't even be a topic. I've, I've told people that we ought to be talking about, you know, making sure that we keep ourselves safe from aliens from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, that's a great point. You talk about the fact that, you know, it is, it's 2020. And, uh, you know, in our lifetime, we've been through this whole, uh, transition but so let me ask you uh john mons you know 
ha has it gotten better? You know, I, I people say, you know, the light, we want it to keep getting brighter. Has it gotten better? Have you seen progress as somebody who, you know, has been involved in politics and, you know, you've obviously been a leader in the Libertarian Party for a long time. Are we getting better as a country politically? I, I would say in some areas, yes. I mean, we do not have it. And, and I can speak personally. I, I know I don't have it as bad as my ancestors did. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there has been progress, most most definitely. And, and hopefully my kids uh, won't have to deal with some of the things that I had to deal with growing up, uh, whether that was up north in Michigan or, or in the south where I finished high school. So, I mean, there's progress being made. But the, the fact is, we still have a long way to go. And uh, one of the questions you said earlier was, uh, being black and being in the, in the libertarian party, this is the place to be. And, mm -hmm. and, and I love uh, sharing, uh, you know, my, I guess, advocacy, you know, with anybody in any realm, whether, whether they are, uh, their background is Republican or Democrat or, or whether they're uh, of different, different ethnicities. Um, Cause it, the, what it boils down to is, is freedom. And, and there's no other party out there. Uh, we can hold our platform up to any party out there. And if you're talking about being free, then uh, nobody can hold a candle candle to us. So um, I agree with uh, Dr. Lewis that what's going on today is nothing new. <laughs> this has been going on forever. Um, it's just been some cases that now with the ad advent of video and cell phones that more cases uh, come to light, but um, uh, there's a history of lynching and, and all kinds of behaviors. Uh, we can talk about uh, uh, Tulsa, Black Wall Street. We can talk sure. about the riots in Atlanta uh, and, and in Rosewood. Rosewood yeah. You know, th th this is this is nothing new, but hopefully our, our response is better. Um, doing things like uh, one thing we did in, in Grady County several years ago to try to head off an incident happening is having a town hall with the police chief and the sheriff who were very willing to do so. Um, they said, hey, man, we'd love to talk to the community. And it was an opportunity for the community to come together and ask questions of the, the leaders in, in law enforcement in, in our area. Uh, the unfortunate thing about it was there wasn't a lot of the public that showed up. I was, I was very disappointed. But you know, I was glad to be a part of it and ask some of the tough questions. Uh, some were answered, some weren't. Uh, when you talk about police uh, procedure and policy, and, and you know what kind of weapons they have, you talked about demilitarization of the police. You know, those are some of the topics that came up. Those are going to be part of the continuing conversations that we have going forward. So, um, you know, we are definitely in the right place. I appreciate that. And so I want to bring in uh, another guest. Uh, I first met him when he was running for governor in California, uh, Nicholas Wildstar. Thanks very much for uh, for joining us. Hey. Now, I know that uh, the yeah, and, and, I don't know how much you guys have met each other yet, but uh, I'm Just very happy. Not to, yet. All right. Well, I'm very happy. Yeah, I'm happy to know you guys. I wonder if you could talk. Now, so, uh, I, you know, guys, I, I'm going to so, I'm going to dispense with formality. I'm going to start calling you all, all by your first name, if that's OK. That's uh, cool. All right. Good enough. So. Uh, so, Nicholas, let me ask you, uh, do you prefer Nicholas? You prefer Wildstar? Either or just as long as you remember me, my man. <laughs> well, <laughs> for, fortunately, you have you have guided me significantly. I've sought your advice several times over the years, and I appreciate you giving it to me. Um, so as somebody who, you know, you're now running for office, okay, and we have this big period of unrest. Do you feel like, to a certain extent, your campaign is impacted because the number one thing that people want to talk to you is about being black and what's happening as opposed to just being the candidate for governor or has it given you an opportunity to actually say, look, this is why my campaign is so important. I believe it's a little bit of both. Um, I think it comes with the territories when you're being, when you're 
a unicorn, which is a, a black man in the Libertarian Party. I mean, let's just be honest, but it's predominantly, you know, uh, majority white uh, membership. So being a black man involved in the Libertarian Party already sets you apart um, as a candidate. And when you come on the scene, when you offer the ideas of what you can do to disassemble the police departments and, you know, um, decriminalize drugs and, you know, get rid of licensure, gun licensure, um, occupation, occupational licenses, uh, those sorts of things that have impacted the black community, it sort of gives us an advantage because, you know, the Libertarian Party has always advocated for those, um, those types of liberties, whether you're black, white, or, you know, any shade of brown in between. So that's the beautiful part of being able to stand on such a, um, uh, such a valued principle. Uh, and again, I guess when it comes to you being a candidate, uh, uh, running for office is to be expected that it's going to come up the whole black, white issue at some point, especially when you're speaking of these issues. So it's given me an advantage because I, I am accustomed to those types of, uh, you know, um, egregiences and violations personally. And I know friends and family members that have. So uh, it gives me an opportunity to speak on those issues. Now, being given the platform to do so is another story. That's hard to find, you know. Right. Uh, the mainstream media doesn't want to give us much of the limelight because they know if they were to do so, we would steal away that large voting block away from the Democratic Party that has heavily relied on them and their policies to change what happens in the inner cities and people of color. Um, the same thing for those black people that are involved with the Republican Party that are seeking to minimize government and, you know, their involvement in our personal affairs, uh, us being able to manage our own money. And uh, these, again, are very popular ideas to where if we were to be given a, a, uh, a, a larger soapbox, I think would, would definitely get us some wins. I know for sure John Mons. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so that's a great thing. And I'm actually, I'll go to John on this next question. You know, is there a point in time at which you have had uh, some sort of uh, interaction with uh, the press where you think to yourself, you know what, I'm not getting the coverage here. And you're wondering, is it because I'm the libertarian candidate or is it because I'm an African-American candidate? Can you cut it that fine? I like the fact that uh, Nicholas said, you know, unicorn. <laughs> uh, you know, there's situations where we don't know exactly what the scenario is and we have to try to figure out what the bias is that's against us. Can you talk to that as somebody who, you know, obviously has a lifetime of bias against you in various stages? Well, I've been very fortunate. We've done a lot of great groundwork here in Georgia. So the times where I, I ran for office um, five times now, I, I did not uh, see the, the bias, uh, you know, other then what would happen to anybody as far as being a part of a, a, a so-called third party? Um, I had the opportunity to do TV debates, televised debates. Uh, I was invited to all the forums and, and a lot of times uh, forums that my opponents would uh, would not even show up to. Uh, we I've always been open to going wherever uh, I'm welcome. So, no, I, I, I hadn't to my knowledge, experience bias um, other than you, you're not going to get a lot of coverage, but the AJC down here, Atlanta Journal of Constitution has, has given us uh, good coverage and stories in the past. Like say, uh, Georgia Public Broadcasting has invited us to debates with the other candidates. So I mean, I've had a, a very good experience running for office here in Georgia. And I, I think that's because of the groundwork, like I said, that the leadership and, and the Libertarian Party of Georgia has laid out uh, 
for for decades and we've been able to have some success and earn some respect uh, across the board right um so that's uh, good i'm unmuted uh so that's an interesting thing and you talk about the media coverage and stuff like that now dr lewis when you ran uh for mayor in hartford uh you actually got a couple of good articles published in the paper one of the things that I'm interested in is finding out, is there a difference between, uh, you know, you coming back to your community? Uh, you know, I, we talked about first being black in the Libertarian Party. Can you talk about what it's like to be libertarian in the black community? Uh, and you know what, guys, I, as crazy as it sounds, I have something going on in the background. Uh, I'm going to have to go take care of it real quick. So please continue the discussion among yourselves right now, and I'll be back as soon as I can. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I didn't have the same um, experience um, as, uh, you know, Brother Mons um, did with regards to um, everyone being 100% um, uh, welcoming, uh, particularly um, as a libertarian. And, and real interestingly, my, my biggest opposition outside of fair fighting came from the Democratic Party. Um, in Connecticut, I was blackballed. I was lied on. Um, you know, the Democratic um, um, town committee chair um, prefabricated stories, tried to malign my name <laughs> in in the Hartford Current, um, and so it's a different animal in Hartford. Hartford um, is is a city um, that is perhaps around you know twenty eight to thirty uh, percent black people. Um, you know, people of the diaspora. And then, um, you know, you have another uh, 38 or so percent uh, Latinos uh, from varying places, mostly Puerto Rico, that, um, you know, that make up the, 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 the demographics of Hartford. Um, however, the remaining, um, you know, people that are Asian and, 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 and perhaps, you know, close to, I don't know, 15 or 20 percent Caucasian people, uh, they run the city. And so I've I've said this before uh, publicly that as 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 much as black people have complained about the racism and try to you know tag that whole racist uh, uh, you know agenda and stigma on Republicans, my experience my experience I can't speak for anybody else has been that uh, uh, white people in the Democratic Party in its higher tier. I'm not talking about entry level um, <laughs> Democrats. I'm talking about those that have been career professionals that on the state level, that are on the state um, committees, you know, the Democratic State Committee, um, the, the Democratic National Committee, that the white people that obtain those positions are arguably some of the most racist white people that I've experienced in my life. And, and what they have strategically done is not only alienate and segregate um, people that look like me and, and those of us that are on this line from being able to disseminate truth to them by making them believe that the Democratic Party is the only party for Black people, the only party for Latino people. And I, I'm an outspoken critic, critic of the lies that are, are being told. It's not the party for Black people. It's not the party uh, for, for Latino people or, or any minority for that matter. It's a party that very safely, I can say, started out um, being a party that represented the interests of a people that were disenfranchised. And then after 64, after the civil rights bill was passed, uh, seemed to have been the place where black people called home. But uh, one of the things that I'm very eager to do is to help people of color to understand that if a house is burning down, it's all right to leave. It's all right to leave that house because mm -hmm. at this point, a lot of people that look like me believe that even if a house is burning down to the ground, they they are still committed to stay there and they still call it home. <laughs> and it's all right to change an address. It's all right to move. So I'm trying to appeal to people of color that because you've been in a house for a long time, 50, 60 years, and some people in this country far longer than that, that we need to begin a process of reevaluating. Does this party work for me? You, if you're in your 80s, my father, you know, made his transition 
uh, back in December. He was 89 years old. He's a, a an immigrant of Jamaica, West Indies. Great man. He was a bishop in the Church of God. He lived a great life. He was a lifelong Democrat, lifelong since he got to the country in 1955. Uh, but I remember going to the um, um, to the nursing home and talking to him about politics while I was running for mayor. And just before he made his transition, and he told me, he said, I no longer have faith in the politics of America. This is an 89-year-old dying man. And the reason why is because he believed that the Democratic Party had totally changed from 1955 until 2019. And he's right. It's not the same party. It doesn't have the same interest. It doesn't have the same focus. And so a lot of times in our community, um, as in even some Caucasian communities, particularly in Europe and Italy and Ireland, and I've visited all over Europe and Germany, we have, and you know, I always think that we're even, uh, we, we've got a, a little bit of a, a, an advantage when it comes to oral tradition. We just, it's just natural for us. We, we pass things down to our young people orally. We're gifted at that. It's just, you know, don't, don't, don't even hate on us. It's just something that we right. just got. <laughs> and so, and so when we were given an oral tradition from our ancestors to tell us how, you know, things should be, we, we forgot to evaluate time, space, reality. There was a certain time where that advice was awesome. But when that, when that advice is no more relevant to where we live right now, then we have to consider changing. And I believe that the most drastic um, um, times um, that we're living in is today, particularly for people of color who are hook, line, and sinker signed up, you know, for the Democratic Party. They, you know, it, it's like, right. it, it's their God, it's their, it's their everything. <laughs> and so that's something that to me, uh, completely needs to be reviewed because it's not that same party anymore. And unfortunately, it hasn't been that same party in a very long time. And, you know, I, I'd love to hear what, what my, my brothers are thinking about the, the, the question as well. Actually, I got a cosign on what you're talking about because, um, like Malcolm X put it, you have the house slaves and yeah. the field slaves. And <laughs> House slaves definitely don't belong in the field because they care too much about the property. And right. the house is burning down. They're willing to lay their own lives on the line to protect it. We see that happening with the Democratic Party, and it's shifting openly to becoming a socialist party. They even right. have openly started to brand themselves as democratic socialists. Right. And it's unfortunate that they're taking advantage of people's lack of knowledge of different political philosophies and how they work and what history, uh, you know, whether it be Mussolini or uh, Hitler or, you know, uh, shit, George W. Bush. political. <laughs> 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 Um, you know, how, how those political bodies actually apply to society. So, um, yeah, it, it, I, I'm, I'm with you. I've experienced more prejudice from the black community when it yeah. comes to uh, being invited in and embraced as a libertarian. Um, right, right. Are we like Republicans, you know, and do we want to just get rid, rid of welfare? And it's like, um, once you explain a lot of the ideas, then they understand it more, but it's still because of the conditioning that has been, ha has yeah. happened over decades, over centuries even, um, to the black community over that dependency on these political parties, these two parties to provide for them that where they kind of don't want to even take into accordance that another party could be better fitted for them. Um, I, I believe that Brother Miles would probably, or what's up, Alex Merce said in the house. Let me join in, uh, make two quick points. And, and Alex, uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. One is if, if you're a student of history, you will under, understand that uh, one, the North, was uh, in some respects as racist as the South. Now the, the South gets a, a, a bad name, of course, right. but of course, 
know, I grew up in Michigan. And when I talked to my parents and my grandparents about some of the things that they faced uh, in Michigan, in Illinois, and over in Chicago, uh, it, it, it wasn't, you know, as pretty like the North was some, you know, oasis for a lot of folks. That's, that's one point that I'd like to make. So, you know, hearing about some of the things that you're facing, Dr. Lewis, in, in Connecticut, most people are like, oh, no, they're great up there, right? Uh, that's one point. The other point is uh, uh, paradigm shifts. Now, before uh, the 60s, and Republicans try to make this point for, for a different reason, but the African-American community were, I'd say, 90 plus percent Republican from, from Abraham Lincoln, you know, all the way through the 60s. Uh, and a, a lot of people, even, even in the civil rights movement, uh, we're still Republicans. Uh, some to this day, a lot. Uh, some of the older generations have never given up on the Republican Party. But what Republicans are selling now, trying to attract African Americans, uh, hopefully it won't work because of their track record. And and that's also, I think, a good point, uh, an advantage we have. You know, I love. I talk just as bad about Democrats as I do Republicans because they're both horrible. Yeah. And you know, we have an opportunity you know, to really make hopefully a, a new paradigm shift. We're not going back and forth with between Democrats and Republicans, but throw libertarians into the mix. Yes, just before Alex says something, I just wanted to bring out the point also in some of the diabolical um, uh, moves, um, the unfair moves of the Democratic Party that so many black people don't realize was not Republican, certainly wasn't libertarian, far from libertarian, even with regards to the destruction of the black family. I mean, the welfare system that was set up um, where, you know, if, if the father was anywhere juxtaposed, anywhere near to the house that that, you know, a young lady lived in that was, you know, his child's mother, her welfare uh, would be uh, completely shut off. Um, her housing would be taken away from her. They, those, the Democrats devised these plans to destroy the black family. But yet at the same time, as long as they were giving them money, they didn't know that the same one, one that was giving them money was also feeding them poison at the same time. I mean, you know, let's, let's be quite honest, you know, even though um, um, Mr. Reagan um, um, began the process. Actually, Nixon started the, the war on drugs and, and then Reagan, you know, uh, the baton was passed over to him. But then from Reagan, it went to Bill Clinton, who had to prove to the uh, uh, American uh, public, particularly people that were afraid of black folks, that we are, you know, number one, like Mr. Clinton's wife uh, said, that we are super predators right? Black men are super predators and that we're going to be so tough on war that we're going to make sure that we have mandatory minimums. That was under a Democratic president. And so I, I'm just wanting to remind people that look like me that there's a, there's a history of deceptive undercutting things that have been so divisive, so evil, so wicked that, listen, people say to me, well, so uh, Dr. Lewis, are you a Republican now? And, and, and I said, well, let me tell you something. The, the person who, first of all, all Republicans are not racist, all right? To say that would be wrong. It would be untrue. But what I do love, listen to me, this is going to sound crazy. What I do love about racist Republicans is that I know that they racist. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. I know they're racist. So, it, it, it doesn't phase me because at least they let me know where they live. They they draw, they draw get a piece of chalk and draw around their house and say, don't come. I'm good. It's the racist Democrats that 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 work with you, that that work on your campaign with you, but then stab you in the back. It's the ones, you know, like the law of the lid that don't want you to go but so high in the corporate ladder. And they do things in an undercutting way. Man, I'm trying to tell you, they have done some things that they are going to have to answer for because it's been completely wicked. And, 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 and first and foremost, for people of color, it's the complete disregard. Yes, this is Democrats. The disregard, the disrespect, and the dismantling of the Black family unit. That, you know, and, and, and Alex, take it from there. Take it from there. <laughs> first off, I just want to say that 
it's been amazing to hear you guys' experiences. Uh, it's some, that was some very powerful stuff, and I definitely have some other questions for you. I just wanted to kind of speak to them and just empathize because uh, as, a, as, a, as a Latino libertarian, I've also kind of run into some of what you, you guys have mentioned about where you kind of see pushback from your community when you go back to bringing these ideas where they're like, okay, you, we've been Democrats. We should always be Democrats just because that's just the way things work. Um, and, uh, you know, I do think that that, that corner is running. I definitely feel that there's some momentum as far as the, the inclusivity and the uh, approachability of, of libertarianism in politics. And, and I thank you guys for being really at the forefront of that. And that's a uh, big hug to all of you. <laughs> um, but um, back to but you. basically, yes. <laughs> and then with that, just kind of with this sentiment, and I think there's, there's a really at the core of like of Juneteenth is a real libertarian sentiment that we're we're not free till we're all free, and that's right. a, like a beautiful that's a beautiful sentiment, and uh, kind of touches my heart. Um, but uh, can you guys tell me a little bit about some of the experiences on, in your campaigns, reaching out to voters, where you feel like moments where you felt like you broke through some of that cognitive dissonance? Because there is a lot of that, like you were mentioning with the policies, like the Democrats want, where they want a lot of policies where in, in both sides, they always want more things to be crimes, more things to be whatnot. And then those right. are the things that create this whole situation that, that is pernicious uh, to poor communities, to minority communities. Um, and we're seeing that is a big part of the conversation today. But I mean, in your conversations, in your campaign, sort of, where do you feel when you're reaching out to people in different communities, you feel like the conversation breaks through? Well, uh, for, for, first of all, when I ran, in the city of Hartford. I started a school in the city of Hartford, uh, um, second to eighth graders is a supplementary school uh, that emphasizes um, uh, literacy, foreign language and STEM fields for second to eighth graders. And so I ran on education and, and I was completely shocked that the years of advocacy, the years of fighting for uh, blacks and Latinos in the city of Hartford, that I didn't have a more overwhelming uh, response from the community. Um, there were things that uh, the, the incumbent um, did to, to block all of my progress. Um, definitely the Democratic chair uh, did literally illegal things um, to stop my visibility, my progress. Um, the Hartford Current is completely complicit with the Democratic Party in Hartford. So it's, it's the good old boys club. And, and one of the things about politics, you have to have skin and to just keep on moving forward despite what they do. I'm gonna keep running for public office um, because um, I'm going to keep making that statement that we're here and we're not going away. And that's one of the things that I think that, uh, that I'm extraordinarily happy about um, my, my fellow brothers on, the, um, um, on this uh, uh, broadcast to, to this evening, that they are not going away. That's, I love that about y'all, all of y'all, all three of y'all on this, you're not going away. Cause that's what they want us to do is to go away. We're in a, a very strategic position to make some tremendous things happen. Uh, but the things that they do to try to discourage us, uh, we just have to be that much more intentional. And within the Black and Latino community, I can speak for the state of Connecticut, there's a level of um, um, apathy. There are some people that say that Blacks and Latinos in Hartford, in Bridgeport, in Waterbury, don't want anything. And, and the reason why they say that is not to be disparaging about people of color, because anytime a Puerto Rican or a black person is disparaging another black person or Puerto Rican person, much like Candace Owens, I tune them out all the way because I can't talk to them. I, I lost you now. Because, mm -hmm. because there's a way to have a conversation about black folks without perpetuating the cycle that there's something wrong with us. And so I think that she has mental illness and I've said that publicly because you don't disparage another person to make your point. And black, let, Blacks and Latinos are beautiful, intelligent, wonderful, amazing people that are worthy, you understand? But the problem is that, and I love the word that my brother Wild, Wildstar said just a moment ago, we've been conditioned. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mad at you, because, but I know that there's work that has to be done with unconditioning us. We've been conditioned to um, take from the oppressor and, 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 and be very excited about it, to take you know, the, the welfare, to take the subsidy from the one that's killing us, the one that's trying to dem demise our future. 
but we're not aware of it. And so we've also been conditioned to not ask or to not know what to ask for. How can you um, um, vote for a person who doesn't care about education when the children represent the now and the future? So if, if you're thinking you know, more about your police force than you're thinking about education, something's wrong. And we believe in having a strong police force. I don't believe in defunding police as you know the, the culture is saying now because um, right now they're not paid enough. And if they have to do three and four people's job, trust me, they're not gonna just kill black folks, they're killing everybody. You understand? <laughs> they, they're gonna be overworked and underpaid. So I, I'm not really there on the concept of defunding the police, but black people need to be taught. And I would even say by black people, how to think about politics, not by white Democrats. You understand? Because a white Democrat uh, and I'm not saying all, so I'm not generalizing, but many, particularly those at the top level, the white Democrats are going to teach black people, especially impoverished black people, how to think in a way to keep them elected so that they can perpetuate the cycle of their crimes against humanity. That's what they do. And so we have to understand, number one, that the party is not the Democratic Party is not the savior party. That's the first thing that they have to understand. It's not the savior party. I love the fact that libertarianism represents, like my brother Ma, John Mount said, it represents freedom. It is the only party that stands out with that ethic, freedom and liberty, the only party. And secondly, it represents for every black person, Latino, every minority on the, on, on the planet, Anybody that comes through these uh, these shores and, and touches America, it represents a choice. And so, when you hijack the, um, the 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 system where you got this big giant bald eagle and you got one wing called the Republicans and mm -hmm. the other wing called the Democrats, it's the same bird and they're flying the same place. One hangs out in the south, you know, during the winter. The mm -hmm. other one hangs out in the north during. The, it's the same bird, and when you don't understand that. You get caught out, you get caught out. And that's why I think most Americans are. I think most Americans need to be libertarians and, and, and say the heck with this nonsense. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving a, a parties that don't represent the interests of the people because as you were saying and, and alluding to Alex, that if we're not all free, none of us are free. And so we have to get back that, to that mentality that when you suffer, I feel it. You understand? So we have to understand the balance of both individualism, which I believe in, and collectivism, which I believe in. You can't have both, and there can't be a healthy balance of, of both. And it looks nothing like socialism, and God knows it looks nothing like um, 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 not socialism, um, um, communism. Nothing like it. it. It has no semblance of that. It looks like the America that we envision could be a reality. And that, that, that's you know what I really believe. Well, Alex, I, in, in answering your question uh, about you know moments when you think you've had a, a breakthrough, a, a lot of times you don't know, but that's, mm. that's uh, why messaging is so important. It's like planting seeds. Uh, you don't know if it's gonna germinate in somebody's mind or not, but you have to keep planting seeds. So we look, uh, have an opportunity, I, kn I know I do, in approaching uh, issues and maybe giving people different perspectives. It, you know, I talked about, you know, ending cash bail, uh, civil forfeiture, and, and what that does, not just to black people, but to all people. I know uh, I had an opportunity to go on a, an a African-American radio station and the, the topic of criminal justice reform came up. And I said, well, we have to end, you start with ending the drug war. And they were like, well, what drugs? I said, all drugs. And so that's something, you know, that I could, you know, give and speak to. Uh, my my sister-in-law actually died of a drug overdose. And, you know, so you have to go out there and speak to these issues that a lot of times the other parties, you know, aren't going to uh, bring up. You know, talking about the Second Amendment. You know, if, if anybody should should be in favor of, uh, carrying weapons to protect themselves, it should be the African American community. And Absolutely. historically, we have. We've always wanted 
to have better ways of protecting ourselves. This phenomena now that's in vogue probably since the, the, the 70s of, well, we want to get rid of people's ability to have guns and carry guns. This is a new phenomenon. We've always wanted to be able to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. So I always, I encourage folks, I carry a gun probably 80, 90% of the time. Uh, and I encourage anyone, if you can legally do so, purchase a firearm and learn how to use it. You know, my, whether it's my kids, my family, uh, you know, my college classmates, high school classmates. So we can talk to issues like that. But these are issues that are common with, 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 any and everybody, you know, the, the, having the police, you know, not protecting you. I gave a talk, for example, back in November of last year, and I, I made three points, but I thought, and this was a predominantly African-American crowd, non-libertarian. But out of those three points, I think one of the most important ones I made to them, and I think they got it, was this. The government is not your friend. And I gave them 400 years of example. And now they're not going to hear that from the Democrats. They're not going to hear that from Republicans, but they'll hear it from a libertarian or somebody like me or anybody on this panel or in the party, because historically it's very accurate. The government is not. And that in, in itself change, should change people's mindset. I said, you know, if you look at who's been causing the problems in our communities, should you go to them and look for answers? And, and that is that is ridiculous. But that's a lot of times what these other parties are preaching. You know, elect me, put me in charge. You know, my party or the government will solve your problems. How are they going to do that when vast majority of the problems are caused by the government, whether it's housing discrimination and, and, and ghettos and, and, you know, uh, criminal uh, police law enforcement. These are all government agents, you know, discrimination, you know, across the board. So we have to message clearly that freedom is the answer. And, and whether it resonates or, or whether it clicks with somebody, uh, we may not know until, you know, down the line somewhere. But, you know, we're doing what we need to be doing. That is that false sense of self, uh, security that government creates. It's the reliance upon them that they have the answers when really they don't. They're just regular people like us and they don't have some, you know, magical machine that's giving them the right answer to solve homelessness or, you know, the drug problem or domestic abuse or whatever the case may be. So for them to assume the position and to create laws um, that dictate our society is where they're, um, they're over exercising their power. So the confusion comes in thinking and what's lawful and what's legal, you know, and us having the natural right, the natural lawful right to protect ourselves should never be infringed upon. And we don't need a piece of paper to tell us that's okay. We need a piece of paper to tell the people that we put in positions of power that that's okay. And to protect and respect that natural right. That's what the constitution is there for. So um, in educating the black community about how gun reform could definitely be advantageous for us, license reform could be advantageous for us, drug policy reform, you know, criminal justice reform, all of these different um, social conditions that have affected our community the most, how we can change them through the Libertarian Party is the, I, I guess, the, uh, the hump that we're trying to get over here, the hurdle here in the middle of the road. Um, but what Alex is talking about is right. It, it's, um, you know, we're not free until uh, all of us is, are free. And actually, I was out collecting signatures for the recall of the governor here. And um, a Mexican gentleman walked up to me and he said, I just want to tell you, I appreciate everything that the, you know, the black people in this country have done in fighting for freedom, because that's actually made it easier to pave the way for the Hispanic community. You know, you guys 
black people fought alongside Mexicans in the Mexican American Revolutionary War. Uh, uh, um, so it's basically a matter of us coming together in union and knowing that solving the black issues also solves the brown issues. And <clears throat> if we can articulate this in a, in a way to where more people of color are embracing and supportive of those ideas, they'll start to vote libertarian. We have to encourage them to do so if they want to do so civilly and peacefully through the electoral system, opposed to going out there and, you know, having to protest uh, continuously every time there's a murder or some sort of uh, issue that we're all upset about societally. So, um, Hopefully everyone out there that's watching this video will be encouraged to get involved in the party. I got to say, Brother Lewis, though, with regards to defunding the police, I'm all about that. <laughs> here in California, the uh, uh, budget for the police is completely um, inflated and, uh, and they're, they're overpaid. Um, the majority of police officers receive six to eight times the median salary here in the state of California. Wow. In those police shootings, they're often given administrative leave with pay uh, for months, wow. if, you know, um, before they end up having to retire or are let go. But then they're still able to collect their pension. Wow. Another six figures and millions of dollars that we, the people, the taxpayers, black community, brown community, white community, all community ends up footing the bills for. So I think it would be advantageous for us to start focusing on ways to where we could um, start paying them based on their performance. Also, you know, uh, with those officers that are being overpaid, if you have complaints against you, then that should reduce your salary right? You know? um, because if you are providing that critical service to the community and it's appreciated, then, hey, we're going to ha be happy to pay you top dollar. But mm -hmm. if you're failing at doing so, then you shouldn't even be on the job. And right. a lot of them are given that immunity through that, you know, uh, uh, what is it that uh, Amish is advocating for? The uh, qualified immunity? Qualified immunity for officers, yeah. The police bill of rights, that's that extra layer of protection that gives them legal, you know, protection when it comes to these um, violations of their constitutional oath. That's their job. And right. You know, I, I, I know that where you are is, is a complete demographic that because you're in California, right? Yeah. And so it's 40 million people there. There's only about three and a half million in Connecticut. And so the demographics are so different. And I, and I get what you're saying that particularly if, if those um, um, salaries are overinflated, but even, even still, right? And I don't, I don't argue your point, but one of the things that I'm thinking though, is that from what you're saying, they, we just need reform in how policing is done and how payout is done. Because I do be believe that they need to get paid uh, based on performance. You understand what I'm saying? And I believe if they kill an innocent life, um, in the name of racism or bigotry, they don't need to get paid at all. What they do need to get paid is called jail. It's called prison. The same way that we would get paid if we killed somebody. Yeah. And so I think that the system it needs more of a, a, a an ego eye view than just defunding the police. I think if we just defund the police, that's not going to solve the problem because I think that the problem will still be there and may even uh, intensify. I just believe that we need to get some policymakers that stop racist policies that has been lasting forever. I mean, racist policies in policing has been now for 120 years. So that's a long time. So I think that we need to have real hard and serious conversations uh, that, that, that will at least address these things. The Libertarian Party has been addressing these things for, for, for years and have been being ignored and for the most part, you know, when somebody wants to um, get a great soundbite, they come to the Libertarian Party. I'm mean, even like what uh, of John Miles was saying, you know, somebody's going to steal what you said on the Republican or Democrat side. I'm telling you right now, you should have copyrighted what you said. We're about to 
run out of time, but you know, we have mm -hmm. to look at the amount of laws. Uh, one thing, you, uh, the Constitution came up, and if you look at the 13th Amendment, it didn't free folks. It, 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 it legalized slavery. Right. And when you look at people being murdered for selling loose cigarettes or even uh, mm -hmm. allegedly passing a, a fake $20 bill, now, 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 these things shouldn't mean a, a death sentence to anybody, right, right. but we have to look at these laws because if, if you can criminalize everything, then you can enslave everybody. And that's a, a lot of what's going mm -hmm. on. So all aspects of this whole so-called criminal justice system uh, needs to be reformed. So, um, you know, but that's what we're working on. And, and I'm, I'm proud to, to be a part of this party. And anybody who's watching needs to go to lp.org uh, and and com just compare what we believe in to those other parties. And I, I think if you truly want freedom, then you'll get on board and and and, and get on the freedom train. <laughs> I'm telling you. And I want to say that I'm I am very proud to have you guys in the party. You guys are great. You guys have done great work. And uh, yeah, it, it makes me excited to be part of a party that's doing such amazing work and has such amazing people across the country. Uh, all of your states are states that I, I have fond connections to. Georgia, Savannah's where I had my honeymoon. I grew up in Manchester, Connecticut, right by Hartford. Wow. My mother lives in Oakland, California. Yeah. So wow. um, you, you, guys, you guys are in states that are close to my heart. But, oh, wonderful. Um, as we wrap up, I just want to give an opportunity for you guys to say, to tell people where can they follow you guys because you guys are great you guys have a lot to say i want to make sure that people after today can still keep following what you're saying so where can they find i mean you? check check me out on youtube I, you know everybody hits me up on youtube or facebook um, um either or hit me up um and and, and stay in contact oh, youtube is probably even better i'm, I'm always twitter as well <laughs> hit me on twitter at dr aaron lewis one on twitter um on um youtube aaron lewis on youtube look me up i'm the you know I'm, I'm the caramel ball head black dude. You can't miss me. You can't miss me with the big nose. That's me, right? <laughs> Click, subscribe. All you got to do. That's what's up. <laughs> uh, hey, my name again is Nicholas Wildstar, former two time candidate for California governor and mayor of Fresno. If you want to find out more about me, all you got to do is visit my website, governorwildstar.com. That again is governorwildstar.com. Governor wild like an animal star like in the sky dot com and uh all of my social media connections are there whether it's facebook twitter instagram um so definitely connect with me on those platforms also um i would say anybody uh oh there we go thank you I appreciate it. I love it. <laughs> oh, it. Yeah. So <laughs> anybody that wants to get involved with me, I'm a raptivist. Uh, that's basically a, rap a rapper that uh, uses the art of music to, you know, express what's wow. going on in the world politically and wow. to be involved in, you know, community activism. That's exactly what I am. So um, you can um get my music off of soundcloud <laughs> uh but i would say to anybody out there that wants to support the black community that's watching uh the best thing to do is to help us really take back the community with these candidates here these these people right here that really want to make policy change everlasting policy change that's not going to only um help out the black community, but help out every community in the entire society. So right. please definitely donate, donate, okay? Donate <laughs> to all of our efforts, political efforts and our activism as well. Governorwildstar.com, again, click on donate and you can um, please make a contribution because I am forming an exploratory committee for my campaign for governor of California in 2022. But if this recall is successful, you know, <laughs> then we'll have a special election here in campaign uh, in California and I'll be running my campaign sooner than later. So definitely please be uh, find out more about me and connect with me and let's bring back liberty. <laughs> I would say, don't follow me. I want you to lead. So, you know, go around, you know, uh, you know, check out the party. Seriously, get involved in your community, whether it's in politics or community service, 
or, or or whatever it takes, you know, to educate yourself about really what it means to be free and mm-hmm. find your space, get in and, and put in the work. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of room out there for everybody. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you guys for being here today. Thank you so much. And to everybody out there, uh, tomorrow's Juneteenth, please do celebrate it with the sentiment that's out there and reach out to somebody and just love freedom and just give everyone a hug and enjoy a day to just bask in the idea of freedom. Um, so this is uh, LPTV. Thank you very much. Signing out. Let's do it again sometime. All right, all right. <laughs>